This lecture is about electricity access and to give you an idea, um, lighting in low income countries is often not um, uh, done with uh, electric bulbs. It's generally provided by candles or kerosene or diesel lanterns. Um, this gives you a map of, uh, if you can click on this link and you can see uh, a, a map of the share of population in different countries with access to electricity and uh, and you can see that um, China there's 100% access, India 99.6, some countries in developing Asia have have um, lower shares of household electricity access but it's really sub-Saharan Africa where where uh, household shares of electricity access, so, some in Central Africa lower than 10% of households have access to electricity there, South Sudan 1.1%, Somalia, 18%. Um, and, and why is this a problem? So um, use of, uh, first of all, the quality of lighting is very poor. Um, candles and kerosene are actually much more expensive uh, than, um, uh, than electricity uh, for lighting. Uh, the use of kerosene also imposes health risks. Uh, kerosene as a fuel is a clear liquid often stored in households in developing countries in clear liquid bottles. It can be knocked over, causes very severe fires and burns, and it can be ingested by children who think that it's uh, in a uh, water. So use of kerosene and, and oil are related to risks for cancer um, as well as, as lung disease from the smoke. So switching to electricity eliminates that indoor uh, health risk um, and it also has a much higher intensity of light than uh, than either a candle or um, a paraffin or um, kerosene uh, lamp. If we go back and look at the global trends in access to electricity, so there is a lot of promise. Uh, as I said, China uh, uh, has achieved universal access to electricity in uh, the in the 2000s, which was an enormous success story, um, but still. And, and, and in general, the number of people without access to electricity has been declining very quickly um, in the 21st century uh, from about 1.7 billion people in 2000 to 1.1 billion in 2016. And as I said, around 700 million uh, in 2019. But still in sub-Saharan Africa, 43 percent of the population only have access to electricity. There have been some there's been some encouraging progress in years in the recent years where the total number of people without access to electricity in sub-Saharan Africa has recently started to decline. Um, and progress, this is because of progress in some specific countries, in East Africa especially. Um, and as a result, their uh, electrification efforts outstripped population growth for the first time in sub-Saharan Africa um, in, in around 2012. Um, but overall progress has been uneven and in some countries there's almost no, uh, no progress. And that means that by 2030, Based on today's rates, there'll still be um, around 500, 400 uh, million people without access to uh, electricity, mainly in in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, today, about 89% of the population in developing countries in Asia have access to electricity. You can see here that um, the number of people without access in India has been declining, declining very, very significantly. And in fact, they reached uh, the target of, of bringing electricity, at least a connection to every household um, uh, in the last year or two, which was a huge sort of logistical success. There's still very uh, significant issues with power outages, though, with many, many um, uh, regions only having a few hours of electricity uh, per day. Um, China, um, as I said, reached universal access um, and India has really been a huge success story. So half a billion people gained access to electricity since 2000 uh, in, in India. Um, if we look in more detail in India, um, you can see here the rural population with, without access and with ac oh, sorry without access and with access, and slowly the the share of rural populations with access has been gaining ground. You can see that there's strong population growth in India, um, but electrification um, has has really um, mattered an awful lot. Universal household electricity access was a central political commitment, and that's what really matters for in terms of electricity access. It's um uh, it's political commitment um and um. Uh, one thing that has been very interesting in the last number of years is that historically about 99% of people have gained access with grid extension. And we'll talk about the difference between grid, off grid, mini grid, but, uh, and coal has fueled much of the historical increase in electricity access, causing problems for, um, air pollution and for climate change. Um, but, 
around 75% of new connections are fueled by renewables because of new um, sources of electricity in, in India. Now, so electricity, as I said, can be provided um, by a number of different means. So the, 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 the uh, electricity access is provided to a household is defined as on-grid if it's provided through this central connection to a local network. And this is how we all know our own electricity access. So there's there's some power plant change, um, generates electricity, um, a transformer steps up the voltage to a long distance uh, transmission lines, neighborhood transformers step down the voltage to distribution lines, and then we're all sort of connected to this electricity system. Um, so, you know, the electrons that come into my house are sort of are, are, are coming from the, the centralized electricity grid. Um, and these grids typically draw their power from large centralized uh, power plants like coal, natural gas or hydro, or increasingly from distributed um, generation, which can come here at the distribution level, like solar PV or biogas units, which are connected to the low voltage levels. So new power generation capacity, you know, if you're going to connect more households to the grid, you need to generate new electricity through these through these plants. Um, Investment in developing transmission and distribution networks, these are the, the, the wires, the poles that, that get electricity to our houses, generally is most cost effective when they're built to serve a high density of energy demand. So what that means is that there's a high number of people living together in a, in a town or village and that they have a high uh, demand for electricity or that there's industry and services which demand electricity. Also, the proximity of households to the distribution system reduces the cost of extending the grid relative to other alternatives. So whereas if you have a village or a town um, which is sparsely populated, has a low electricity demand and um, and has complex terrain uh, and far away from the existing grid. There are many, many financial institutional hurdles which, uh, which mean that um, uh, grid extension is much less attractive than the alternatives um, when, when there are alternatives available. So so these basically these these require on economies of scale so the lower the cost when they're closer to the grid greater housing des density and great electricity consumption with anchor loads for example from industry mines agriculture or telecommunications towers a second option for developing countries is increasingly uh, coming in the form of what's called a, as a mini grid a mini grid is a localized power network where um, without in infrastructure to transmit the electricity belong beyond the local service area. So it's generally provides electricity at a higher cost than the main transmission and distribution network system, the on-grid electricity access, and they um, rely on small modular generation. So here's, for example, is a PV uh, plant, or it can also be, say, hydro or wind. Um, here's a, a diesel generator to back up when the, when the wind isn't... Um, blowing or the sun isn't shining um, and here are uh, batteries which can stabilize power uh, store power overnight for example and then there's a, a smaller lower voltage a trans uh, distribution system in the in the village there can be even you know panels individually and it can provide um, provide lighting tele uh, televisions and so on one thing about these is that they, they can be scaled up with rising demand so if if, if there's you know population grows or people want more appliances, you can add more um, more supply. Um, and uh, that can be made compatible with the main uh, transmission and distribution system at a cost. So you can say, okay, we the, the government says that the grid will come here in five, 10 years, so we can make this distribution system compatible with the national one. Um, and, 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 and so that this sort of, this, this can at a future date be, be, um, be made in a way to be compatible with the main grid. But, for many grids to be commercially viable to a developer, um, power demand from households and businesses have to provide an acceptable return on investment. And in many cases, uh, in poor countries with a low density of electricity demand, they may, be, or in cases where the government doesn't have a clear supportive enabling environment, like having a clear grid rollout um, extension plan uh, of the national grid, or a framework that regulates how to how tariffs can be generated. For example, it might be better um, for households to have um, what's called an off-grid or standalone system to provide electricity access. Um, and these standalone systems, they serve one building and they're not connected to any grid. So this is typically now in the form of a solar panel on the roof. The market 
has been dominated by diesel generators. Uh, so you can generate electricity by just having a, a diesel or even petrol generator. Um, but solar home systems, SHS, are becoming very, uh, very popular. So these are most cost effective in sparsely populated areas far from the existing network where people have uh, a low income and low ability to pay for an infrastructure like like um like a mini grid and in many countries the kind of national infrastructure and institutions aren't reliable enough to 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 provide that sort of enabling environment to allow a mini grid operator to come in but an individual house can buy the solar home system and operate by themselves um again they can be scaled up as power demand grows you can buy one solar panel and then, you know, when you've got that paid back, you can buy a second one. Um, but the upfront cost is a critical barrier for many households. But this pay as you go solar is this very interesting new paradigm, which is becoming um, successful. And that is based on daily mobile payments. And that relies on the fact that it's very interesting that there is actually in many countries more mobile phones than electricity access points. So people uh, have access to telecommunications and mobile phones in some ways more than uh, electricity in some developing countries. Um, and with and, and, and there's in uh, a lot of countries this new um, innovation called mobile banking uh, where essentially your your sort of income is 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 tied to your um your mobile account and you can make payments with your phone so you don't re rely on cash it's like a simple credit card uh, and you can also basically get a solar home system which is relies on this pay as you go concept much like your mobile phone um and the the solar panel has a sim card and you make daily payments which can be as low as 50 cents a day um uh, to pay back your solar home system over a matter of maybe 2 to 5 years depending on how how fast that is that relies very much on efficient uh, equipment because efficient equipment like if it, very efficient light bulbs efficient tv and even they're getting into fridges and things like that the more efficient the um the end use equipment the smaller the solar panel can be and therefore the the smaller the um the the the, the um the uh, the solar panel can be and the smaller the cost um so these um the the sort of success of these solar home systems is contingent on uh, the falling cost of solar, which is being very extreme, the falling cost of efficient appliances and these mobile banking systems, it's a very interesting and new viable uh, form of electricity access. There's this other sort of field that we call Pico Solar, and um, these would be like individual appliances attached to something like a solar panel. So like a very small, like a less than five watt solar panel for mobile battery charging, powering an LED light. Um, and they're they're catching on very rapidly. So you see um, these 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 uh, development organizations um, giving these out and they're becoming popular. They can improve um, life for households significantly um, uh, because they provide a very small level of access and the sort of elect the overall cost of these things in terms of giving people light is actually becomes less than um, and what they pay for electricity anyway. So a household can pay a substantial amount of its income on just candles, on, on charging their mobile phones at a at a village kiosk and so on. Um, and if you count them as part of off-grid off sales, they count for um, almost all of total off-grid sales. There are many challenges and barriers for decentralized systems. And the first one there is affordability. And basically, often these decentralized systems are very expensive on a per kilowatt hour basis. And by decentralized there, I mean um, off-grid and mini-grid options. They're more expensive than um, than buying electricity from the grid like, like you and I do. Um, and that upfront cost is a great barrier for households which are which are in the poorest category and even when the overall cost is less than the daily payments for kerosene because you know a lot of households just don't have savings or the access to credit in order to to pay this upfront cost so that new pay as you go business model is tackling that sort of that financial or that upfront cost barrier targeted subsidies and a lot of uh, development organizations are also addressing this by giving low cost financing Technical maintenance and main, um, management challenges are also very significant and you might not have just the technical know-how in villages and communities to be able to um, to install these systems and to maintain and operate these systems. So that requires training, capacity building in communities. Um, and finally, it's often a risky investment for private companies. So if you're relying on, on private industry to come in and try to make a profit from providing electricity, um, 
uh, the, these investments can be very risky if they're in uh, countries with with a with a poor enabling environment. So it's very important for governments to de-risk those investments by guaranteeing revenue, giving this stable regulation environment, and making clear grid expansion plans. But uh, despite all these barriers, the um, the the there's been an acceleration in the number of people gaining access with decentralized renewables. Here, uh, between 2000 and 2012, around 62 million people gained electricity access. Um, uh, per year uh, across the world, across Asia and, and Africa and Latin America. A lot of that was with, with coal, uh, gas, some with oil, uh, and then a smaller amount from renewables like hydro um, and, and a very small amount from decentralized renewables like, like off-grid and mini-grid solar. But since between 2012 and 2015, First of all, the number gaining access is accelerating and also the, the, number, the, the diversity of fuels is accelerating as well. So you're seeing a lot more gaining access with solar PV, um, that's centralized solar PV, but also decentralized um, mainly solar PV as well. Um, and here you have, for example, geothermal in East Africa coming through. Um, so it's electricity access is both accelerating and increasingly um, coming from renewable uh, sources. And in the future as well, so here is the sort of population gaining access by source, 45% um, with coal, 19% with gas and 30% with renewables. That renewables there is mainly, um, as I said, hydro and, uh, and um, geothermal. Um, in the future, what the modeling suggests is that that all fuels will still be important. So coal will still provide a lot of the electricity access. And again, coal, gas, other that's that's centralized uh, generation. You know, that's that's building coal power plants in order to, to generate this. It's renewables really that will um, transform the electricity access landscape. So uh, the, the new report by the International Energy Agency this week, the WEO 2020, suggests that solar PV is becoming the, the cheapest electricity ever in human history. So it's 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 really incredible. And it's 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 not just providing sort of cheap electricity, renewable electricity. It's also providing this new um, electricity access landscape to give people the first electricity for the first time. And we see that here with the grid, renewables will still provide a, a lot, but it's really decentralized renewables that, that looks like um, that most people will gain access with in the future. And so, but even in the future, under existing trends, um, Sub-Saharan Africa will largely remain in the dark by 2030 unless commitments um, are, are are kept to deliver universal access to around five, six hundred million people who will still be without access by 2030 on, on current trends. Um, and that means that livelihoods will um, be, be sort of limited. Um, uh, communications will be difficult. There won't be the basic power to produce goods or improve agricultural yields. And that's why um, this we generated this scenario called the energy for all case and we kind of mapped where actually populations should be. And this is what the night lights picture should be in sub-Saharan Africa um, if you if you give electricity to every every man, woman and child. So we did this detailed geospatial modeling to look at the, that intersection between distance to the existing grid, uh, policy commitments, the co falling cost of renewables and the generation mix within every country to look at what the optimal universal access mix would be. And you can see that to provide that additional electricity access to the 600 million people, um, the lion's share do so with um, um, with with off grid access, so you get grid extension for about 150 million additional people. With hydro actually being the most cost effective um, power generation um, uh, source for for most people, but decentralized solutions, mainly solar PV, is is the most cost effective for for many in rural areas. Um, an additional 26 billion uh, dollars per year is needed in electricity generation and grids, and that is um, uh, that is uh, expensive. <laughs> um, that's on top of 24 billion per year that that is projected will be spent. So it's this more than double uh, the amount that, that that is needed, and all of that in, in almost all of that is needed in rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa, where where we project most people will be left behind. So as I said, under the right conditions, the private sector can play a really important role in providing that investment. People without electricity already dedicate a lot of their income to poor quality, expensive, polluting energy. And business models uh, like the pays you go solar are emerging so that people can kind of divert that expenditure on dirty fuels and on inefficient fuels to these clean fuels like solar and, and efficient light bulbs. Um, uh, but 
additional policies and strong governance is is really one of the most important things to be able to 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 keep this momentum and and deliver universal access by 2030